I want, I want to imagine something positive. I want you to fantasize for a minute. Imagine if those on the left who oppose war because it kills human beings and the libertarians who oppose war because it costs money and kills human beings <laughs> got together and opposed war. And imagine if we put together this sort of enormous coalition uh, at all levels of society that could take on the military industrial complex, that had that kind of support, had the university presidents with us rather than the kids getting pepper sprayed on the university sidewalks, and had all the religious groups and all the non religious groups and the parents, teachers, organizations, and the uh, League of Women Voters, and, and the media outlets and the, the Republican lawyers and lobbyists and it was absolutely mainstream that we were not going to just scale back the, the particular war we're in at the moment or fight it better, but end war, eliminate war, criminalize all war, good war, bad war, humanitarian war, philanthropic war, criminalize it all, eliminate yes. Yes. the war. And imagine if we got together and we wrote down a treaty that said we are going to ban war from the earth. And we got all the nations of the earth to sign it and it became law and it was ratified by the U.S. Senate and it became the supreme law of the land under Article 6 of our Constitution. Uh, you, how many of you have gathered that I'm telling actual history rather than future fantasy? Five or six. Our great grandparents in the 1920s did this thing. And nobody knows it. In the 1920s and the 1930s, war was not popular in this country. World War I had been fought, according to the propaganda, to end wars. And whether you bought that propaganda and wanted to follow through on it, or thought it was a, a load of uh, what Obama accuses Romney of pushing and, and resented it. Either way, you wanted to rid the world of war. There was, a, there was a peace movement that grew up in the late 19th century that had begun to spread the idea that war was evil, that war was murder on a larger scale. And when World War I happened, and people began to learn the truth about it in the years after it happened, there was a universal consensus that indeed, war was the most evil thing needed to be done away with, right? This was in the era when the Nobel Peace Prize had something to do with peace. This was, this was in the era when Carnegie, Carnegie's Foundation for Peace was actually still trying to work for peace. This was an era when the peace movement had incredible funding and incredible buy-in from people in power. And the military-industrial complex barely existed. <clears throat> war was thought of as a European evil. It wasn't treasonous in the United States as it is today to oppose war. We wanted the Europeans to stop buying so many stupid weapons and buy our grain. The farmers had more pull in Washington than the weapons makers. It was a different country. It was a different world. And after World War I, there was all kinds of initiatives to try to do something about this madness of war. There was, of course, the League of Nations that did not make it through the U.S. Senate. There were disarmament conferences that generally resulted in more armaments. Uh, there were endless initiatives for peace and schemes to bring about peace and pushes for uh, for example, a public referendum before Congress could declare a war, which just about became the law of the land in the 1930s, and FDR killed it. Uh, but there were endless efforts toward peace, and huge national and international competitions for the best plan for peace and so forth, and they were all failing, failing, failing for 10 years after World War I. And failing in part because there was this split in the United States between what we would today call the libertarians and then call the isolationists. That is, those who didn't want war because they wanted to stay the heck out of involvement with other countries. Not, not in this sort of simplistic idea of isolationism that we won't talk to anybody. 
right? The way that our government now won't talk to Iran, <coughs> won't talk to Bin Laden and put him in a court, but will, you know, killing people is better than talking to them. It, but in the sense that we didn't want the sort of treaties that had led to World War I that engage you with other countries and require that if country A attacks country B, you all have to attack country A. The sort of things that in fact uh, NATO is the most prominent example of today. That, that idea of isolationism, we don't want to recreate the sort of treaties that led us into World War I in the first place. And then on the other side of this, the peace movement, you had the international folks. You had the people who thought a little more like Europeans, that you know, war is the norm, peace isn't the norm, and we have to work to, to find ways to arbitrate disagreements. We have to create uh, an international court. That, that's another failure that I neglected to, to count, the international court. Uh, and we have to engage with other countries. And so if, if it were possible to find a proposal that both sides of the peace movement liked, it was absolutely guaranteed to pass through the Congress and be ratified by the Senate. Uh, the United States Senate, by the way, is the, is the highest hurdle today and for the past two centuries for any proposal of peace, justice, or decency in the world. It's, it's higher than foreign nations. It's higher than corporate powers, it's higher than Fox News' agreement. I mean, the, the United States Senate was created to block democracy and has done so. But there was, there was far less corruption than there is today. There was far less money in the system. And if you could unite the peace movement around a single proposal, it was guaranteed to go through. Uh, and so a lawyer in Chicago named Salman Oliver Levinson uh, who, raise your hand if you've ever heard of him. John Yor, who's read my books. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Salman Oliver Levinson got it. This is like the, the ultimate example of the, the few dedicated people who changed the world and it's the only thing that ever does. He got his friends together, Jane Addams was one of them, in Chicago and said, we're going to outlaw war. We're going to have a movement called outlawry for the outlawing of war. We're going to make it criminal because war had been legal. After World War I, nobody was prosecuted for war. Nobody had ever been prosecuted for war. Particular atrocities were prosecuted and arbitrated, but not war. And, and if you seized territory through war, well, that was your territory. Uh, he said, no, we're going to ban it. We're going to make it illegal. And that won't end it in a day, but it will start a cultural change. It will set up a court to arbitrate disputes between countries as if countries are civilized persons. So as we did away with blood feuds, as we did away with dueling, and we didn't do away with aggressive dueling and keep defensive dueling, we said individuals should be civilized and settle disputes with words. This was, this was a lawyer who liked to settle his cases out of court. And, and he said, we're going to do the same with war. This is the progress. This is the course we're on. And he was absolutely correct about the course that our civilization had been on for centuries and decades and is still today. Violence is going down in the world. We are moving away from it in countless ways. Uh, but he wanted to do this to war. And so they came up with language for a treaty that said, these nations that are party to this treaty shall never use war and shall settle all disputes by Pacific means alone. But then they couldn't get it through Washington. And they didn't, they didn't handcuff themselves. They didn't tie their hands behind their back by saying, we'll make this a project for this particular elected official or for this party. They made it a massive popular movement that eventually got the Progressive Party, the Socialist Party, the Democratic Party, and the Republican Party on board. Uh, and yet, not sufficiently on board. And so, one of these uh, peace activists went over to France and talked to the foreign minister, a guy named R.C. Briand, and said, I'm going to write a public statement for you that's going to propose to the United States what this massive movement in the United States has been demanding and everybody's been hearing about, that is outlawing war. So the foreign minister of France writes, quote unquote, writes a statement, 
uh, it's under his name, goes in all the newspapers of the world, says, we would like an agreement with the United States to outlaw war. But France wanted it to be between those two countries. Because what France really wanted was that if France attacked someone or someone attacked France, the United States would be obliged to jump in on the side of France, which was exactly what the movement for peace did not want. And, and, so, and so nothing happened. And so a colleague of, uh, of the, the gentleman who actually wrote the statement wrote a reply in the New York Times. And, and eventually, through this sort of ventriloquism uh, and, 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 and civilian amateur diplomacy, which was actually illegal, they built up a movement and convinced the Secretary of State in the United States to get behind it. Now, this was a guy named Frank Kellogg. And Kellogg was a Republican lawyer. He was an angry drunk who cursed peace activists. Uh, he was not what you would think of as the guy, oh, if we can get that person elected or appointed, then he'll do what we want. It was, he's the guy in office, and we have the movement, and we're going to make him do what we want, which is, of course, much more often how history works. Uh, and he went uh, from 1926 to early 27 cursing peace activists to mid-late 1927, doing exactly what they told him to do because he wanted to get a Nobel Peace Prize, which again, still had some relationship to peace. And, and he told France, we want every nation, we want the whole world on this thing. And some of you may have heard a song that was actually written in 1950 called, Last Night I Had the Strangest Dream. I ever dreamed before. I dreamed the world had all agreed to put an end to war. I dreamed I saw a mighty room, and the room was filled with men and the people. Papers they were signing said they'd never fight again. This happened on August 27, 1928, in Paris, France. Germany was there for the first time. Russia was there for the first time. The United States recognized the existence uh, for the first time. And all of the, the, the big powerful nations primarily of the world, I mean the absolute hypocrisy on colonialism and the Monroe Doctrine and so forth, and it was men, the women were outside protesting, but, it, but, but this room filled with men signed this treaty, it was the biggest news story in 1928, this is not like secret CIA history, this is just, they've chosen not to put this in the history books. Uh, and. This became the kellogg briand Pact. Uh, it is on the State Department's website. It is the law of the land. Iran, then under the name of Persia, is a party. Eighty-some nations are parties. Uh, and it bans war. And, if, and it is far superior to the UN Charter, which came along after the war and said, we're going to ban war unless it's war is approved by the UN or war is going to be called defenses. Which are two very big loopholes. You may have noticed we're attacking <laughs> impoverished, unarmed nations halfway around the globe in defense. Right? So, so you know, on the, on the other side of the political spectrum, from where, from where I am, when they want to justify things like making corporations have our rights under the Bill of Rights, they hold up things like marginalia scribbled on the side of Supreme Court proceedings. They hold up federalist papers that are supposed to legalize torture. You know, we have actual laws, actual laws, treaties, supreme law of our land under Article 6 that we can hold up and remind people about. Uh, won't change the world in an instant, but did make a difference. And stopped wars, prevented wars, halted wars, and after, and after World War II, when, when World War II came along, and the State Department and and the government in Washington wanted to figure out a way to prosecute Germans and Japanese for their crimes. A guy named Franklin Roosevelt pulled out the Kellogg-Briand Pact and said, we can prosecute them for the very act of war and for the threats of war under the Kellogg-Briand Pact. And, and so the very first violation of the Kellogg-Briand Pact by its parties, that is to say World War II, resulted in prosecutions of the criminals. And those nations, those big wealthy nations of the world with all the weapons, have not gone to war with each other since. Now, we go to war 
on the darker skinned nations. We go to war on the poorer nations. We have not rid the world of war. We've created a war economy in the United States. Uh, but war is still on the decline globally. And the big powers have not gone to war with each other again yet. And so you have this analysis of the Kellogg-Briand Pact uh, that says not only does the UN Charter replace it, but it didn't work. Now, if we banned drunk driving, and the first time somebody drove drunk and we arrested him, we said, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> we got to legalize drunk driving now. I mean, with no other law does it get violated once, enforced, absolutely result in total compliance by the parties, and we declare it didn't work. Right? So I think that, that it's worthwhile looking again at this kind of history, including looking at what the movement did that created this, the understanding of war that our great-grandparents had, which was not understanding of it as an ineffective tool or as something that needed to be run better or in a more humanitarian fashion or in compliance with the Geneva Conventions or in a stronger coalition with the United Nations and NATO, but as murder, as mass murder. The, 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 the outlawists, if they had been asked, what is your outrage at, at your soldiers urinating on corpses, would have said it is nothing. We are outraged at the creation of the corpses. We are outraged at murder. War is murder. It doesn't need to be cleaned up. It doesn't need to be civilized. It needs to be ended. Right? And now, of course, it needs to be ended much more seriously because of the level of weapons, the environmental destruction, financial destruction that it brings with it. So, so all of this is to say I wrote a book called Win the World Outlaw War uh, that I recommend. And I, we were talking, some of us at dinner today, Coleman's guy, we were talking at, at dinner today uh, about uh, St. Paul principles. You know, all of these cities came up with their principles for uh, organizing uh, and the Occupy movement and so forth and this sort of allowance of violence that goes under the euphemism uh, diversity of tactics. And in contrast to that, there's a guy who used to live in St. Paul, Minnesota, named Frank Kellogg. And his house is a National Historic Landmark. There's a Kellogg Boulevard. He's a big guy in St. Paul. And you can't find anybody who has any idea why he did win that Nobel Peace Prize. Why there's a big avenue named for it. Nobody knows. And so some friends of mine are putting through the St. Paul City Council uh, this year that next August 27th is going to be kellogg Briand Pact Day. The kellogg Briand Pact is going to be displayed in giant banners on all the light posts on Kellogg Avenue. And people are going to be reminded of what was involved in somebody from Minnesota winning the Nobel Peace Prize. So there's, there's free education of some of our history that, uh, that needs to go on. Um, another uh, another book that Coleman can display for you is my man of white over here. Uh, it's called Military Industrial Complex at 50, authored by Coleman and Claire and John Muir. And this was the result of a conference that we held in Charlottesville, Virginia last year uh, at the instigation of John and Coleman and others who had held one in Greensboro. Uh, because we were at the 50-year mark since Eisenhower warned us about the military-industrial complex, that it would completely corrupt our souls and our society. Uh, and I think he underestimated. And here we are 50 years later, and so we brought together a couple dozen, the, the names that are on the front of the book, a couple dozen uh, experts, including Coleman and Claire and John and maybe others in the room here, who had real expertise on what the military industrial complex has become. Because it has become something monstrously different from what anybody had to go up against in the 20s or the 30s. Uh, it dominates our federal spending and our economy and our communications and our thinking to such a degree that it's very hard to imagine working our way around it. Uh, today, we have huge environmental groups that do great work 
trying to preserve our natural environment and almost universally shy away from any opposition to the biggest single consumer of petroleum and polluter of our country and the world, an organization that has pockmarked the face of this country with Superfund cleanup sites. The Pentagon consumes a huge portion of the oil that it fights the wars over. Uh, it is an incredible force of environmental destruction and the environmental groups don't want to take it on because of the flag waving and the music and the patriotism and there are much easier targets for them to take on. We have in this country groups that work on civil liberties, the ACLU, dozens of wonderful groups that do tremendous work. They go after the torture and the assassinations and the lawless imprisonment, but never the military spending that creates those things. And, and you, go, you go down the line through all the areas of public interest and through all those areas of, of trade-offs where we don't have the money for schools, we don't have the money for green energy, for infrastructure, for, 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 for housing, because it's going to the military. And almost none of them, almost none of these areas of, of activism want to take on the military industrial complex, despite the fact that it is the opponent, it is the chief opponent of everything good and righteous in, in this country. It, we are putting well over half of federal discretionary spending every year into a military the likes of which the world has never seen before. Approximately the amount of money the rest of the world spends put together on the military. And three quarters if we count the other NATO nations with ours. Right? We could cut our military by 80%, our military spending, and it would still be the world's largest. And you would think that would be good enough. That if we weren't going out of our way to make the world hate us, having the world's largest military would be sufficient to protect us. Apparently not. Apparently we have to have several times that size. Uh, and if we don't increase it further, according to some prominent politicians, we are all going to die, uh, slaughtered by some as yet unidentified enemy. Um, and, and so, Thanks to, to John and Coleman and others, we, we held this conference and we brought all these areas of interest together and we worked together on how we could envision a movement that would take on the military industrial complex. And this was right at the moment when Occupy Wall Street and all the Occupy movements were starting. And we said then, as, as I will say now, that we have to combine the movement against the plutocracy, against the new aristocracy and the bankers with the movement against the military industrial complex, which is in many cases the very same individuals, uh, or we will not have the movement anywhere near what's needed. But if we do, we can actually dramatically turn things around, which is much, much easier than they want us to believe, has been done before, uh, as my other book chronicled. Uh, and, and I think the number one thing that has changed over these decades is the skill of the, of the propaganda that comes out of the government, including the most ridiculous but most dangerous and powerful lie they tell, which is that we don't have any power. And every politician is skilled at it. It's become an art in Washington, D.C. But when you read the memoirs of peace activists and other activists from recent decades and many decades back, every single time, there are some features that show up in every such memoir, including their best friend worked for the government and they didn't know it, and the government was paying far more attention and responding to their pressure far more than they were told. Uh, and we don't have to go far back. You can look at George W. Bush's memoir in which the, the top Republican in the Senate comes to him secretly and says, we've got to get out of Iraq, we're going to get voted out of power, we don't get out of Iraq. Someone who publicly was not calling us traitors, was pretending we didn't exist. And they're absolutely ignoring us, which is the most powerful thing they can do, because people fall for it. And you read these memoirs from decades back, outside of Kennedy's White House or Johnson's White House, and they have a little crowd protesting, they imagine nobody's listening, they find out decades later that they completely shifted the policy.
massive and highly skilled movement at work to convince us of our powerlessness. And we have to look at the history of countries around the world over the centuries to understand how ludicrous that claim is. Um, so when the war on Iraq happened, the 2003 invasion and the subsequent uh, war making, I had some very intelligent people coming up to me and saying, you know, this is remarkable. This is the first time something this outrageous has happened. A president has lied to us about war. <laughs> <laughs> I, I swear to you, some, some people I highly respect, I'm not going to say their names because I'm embarrassed, even if they aren't, but, but, but I knew enough to know that wasn't quite right. But I didn't know as much as I wanted to know. So I went back and looked at every U.S. war, many non-U.S. wars, the history of war back to prehistory. And I could not find a war that wasn't created by lies, that wasn't sustained by lies, and that wasn't beautified after fact by lies. And so I, I, I wrote a book called War is a Lie. And Coleman? <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't I did list each war and go through chronologically because it would have been endlessly repetitive. I, I, I tried to isolate the most common types of lies so that we, we could see these lies coming and say, oh no, this one is based on lies too, without waiting decades to be told authoritatively there was no Gulf of Tonkin or Spain didn't blow up the main or the Lusitania's weapons and troops were publicly announced before it sailed, or they knew there were no weapons in Iraq, or whatever the case might be, Pearl we wouldn't, Pearl Harbor was known ahead of time, and so we wouldn't have to, in fact, I made World War II <coughs> the biggest, <laughs> the biggest example through all the types of lies in the book, because World War II is still the single biggest reason that people accept that there might be a good war someday. Which is, which is crazy on its face because the comparison between that world and this one in which the United States already occupies the entire globe has sliced the globe up into different commands. Uh, we're moving thousands of troops at, as I speak into Africa. We, we have you know, this ability to make war anywhere on the globe. And every time we talk about these interventions, We've already been intervened in most cases for decades, and what we need is we're switching sides. Ah. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very different world from, from World War II. Not to mention very, very different weaponry in existence, including weaponry that uh, is at serious risk of destroying the entire planet uh, by accident, if not by intention at this point. So, but even if you accept that there might be a good war someday, because World War II was a good war, it's helpful to go back and look at what World War II was and the policies of our government in the decades leading up to World War II that facilitated it, the, the incredible effort by our government to provoke Japan in order to get into the war in Europe by getting into the war with Japan, the, the murderous, destructive policies of the war culminating in the nuclear explosions. Uh, in, in World War II, the, you, you look at something like that that kills 50 to 70 million people, uh, and you say, well, that we needed it to prevent the killing of 6 million people. But it didn't. It didn't. And you try to find a, a poster that says, Uncle Sam wants you to save the Jews, and you can't find it. Because they didn't make them until after the war. Just as slavery didn't come up until the middle of the war, the Civil War. And so you, you, it, it's very helpful to look back at what was good and what was actually bad about these so-called good wars. The War Crimes Times issue in the back there has a long article about the current effort to turn Vietnam into a good war, uh, which will be successful if not resisted. So we, we, have, to be, we have to be constantly telling history. Um, so so in, this, uh, in this book, uh, War is a Lie, I look at this claim that is quite common that war is inevitable. 
that is in our genes. It's always been with us, like poverty. We'll never get rid of it. We must make the best of it, minimize it, clean it up, uh, but be prepared for the necessity of using it because we're realistic and not naive and so forth, you, you know, which is just a line of, of talk that in the 1920s would have been laughed out of the room, uh, but it's a line of talk that is very prominent. And so it, it's, it's helpful to look at the actual history of our species because war is very, very new to our species. Most of its existence didn't have war and very sporadic. Some settled, complex societies have had war and some haven't. Some have had it, gotten rid of it for centuries, brought it back. Some have had it, eliminated certain practices and weapons, brought it back. And, you, and when you look at any particular war, the idea that war happens because of inevitable forces of, of uh, environmental destruction or uh, density of population or testosterone or, you know, becomes so laughable because it takes such an incredible effort to get into a war. And there are so many prominent examples that are very, very similar where we chose not to go into the war, right? And so during the Cold War, the United States uh, had uh, a U-2 plane shot down uh, over Soviet Union and said, we are not going to use this as an excuse for war. We are going to avoid a war. George W. Bush in the White House said to his buddy, Tony Blair, you know, maybe if we paint a U-2 plane with UN colors and fly it really low over in Iraq and they shoot it down, that would be a good excuse to start a war. <laughs> well, if the, ex the excuse is start wars or don't start wars based on a choice made by a group of human beings, not based on some, you know, we, we are absolutely free. We can stop eating. We can stop drinking. We can stop having sex. Maybe that's a little hard one, but we can we can stop uh, we can stop breathing. I mean, there's nothing we're compelled to do. So the idea that we're compelled to get together in large groups and create something as complex as war is just laughable. Uh, and there are many many examples of countries doing away with war. You know, Japan did away with war for a couple centuries before we brought it back to them. Uh, the uh, nation of Costa Rica has put war in a museum. They've done away with their military, put it in a museum. Uh, there are wealthy nations and poor nations. They don't have war. There were, before the, uh, the uh, colonization of the world, peoples in Australia, in our own southwest, in many parts of the world, that didn't know war. There, there's a group of people in Indonesia that's, uh, that's an example of, of, of many others around the world where uh, an anthropologist asked, now you have these poison darts for shooting animals, why didn't your parents and your grandparents use those against the slave traders who were coming to capture you and make you slaves? And the man looks at him in shock and horror and says, because it would have killed them. <laughs> Right? So this is the opposite of the New Hampshire motto of live free or die, right? This is be a slave rather than kill. And both of which are overly simplistic because we now have the force of nonviolent action. Uh, that means we can resist without killing or dying, but uh, or at least without killing. But, but war is not inevitable. It's not in our genes. We don't have to do it. Um, in fact, I think nonviolent action is the answer that people in the 19th century, like William James, were looking for when they said, we need a moral equivalent to war. War is so exciting, so noble, such sacrifice and heroism, that we just can't sell the public on something as boring as safety and peace. It's just not that exciting, you know? We really sort of do have this death wish. I mean, it's, it's more in fashion. Uh, and, and, and yet, if you look at Tahrir Square, if you look at Tunisia, if you look now at the nations that are not in our news from the Middle East, Bahrain, Kuwait, Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia, if you look at Madison, Wisconsin last year, uh, if you look at nonviolent action around the world, this is the moral superior to war. 
this is where you can once, you know, used up all the exciting jobs of firefighters and so forth at home. You want excitement, you know, go be a nonviolent activist for peace and for environmental sustainability. Uh, and you will be working on the crisis that actually threatens yes. us, right? See, we, we, we grew up as a species primarily as, as well as food. Uh, we, were, we were not man the hunter, we were man the dinner. And the, the ancient bone, bones that we were always told by anthropologists through the 50s and 60s that had weapons marks on them, those were teeth marks. Right? We were preyed upon. And war grew up by the need to fight off cats and bears. And when we ran out of cats and bears, you had this class of people who didn't work for a living. You had these, these Mitt Romneys and Sheldon Adelsons. And, you know, and, and so that, did the weapons come first or did the wars come first? The weapons came first. And they began to figure out that if they fought each other, if they fought other tribes of the people who, who didn't, didn't produce anything to eat but had the fancy weapons, they could, they could keep that status. Uh, and, and so, we have this fear built into us of things that barely exist anymore, being attacked by lions and bears. That's what scares us, that's what excites us. The fear of the terrorist who we still depict in editorial cartoons as, as a ferocious animal. The, the fear of, of murder and rape. That's what scares us. But what kills us in far greater numbers is unsafe workplaces, small time gun violence, automobiles, uh, a lack of health care, McDonald's. <laughs> this is what actually kills us in greater numbers. And so if we can come up with, with a way to make it exciting enough, and I'm sure we can, to take on those threats, uh, we can do away with the need to, to make war be the excitement uh, for our young people.